question, the 2002 question one from BMA2, that it's a geometry question. And what you'll want to do with a geometry question often is to start by drawing an accurate diagram. The question asks for an acute angle triangle, so we'll do our best to try and draw one which has almost acute properties. Now we'll label the vertices A, B, C, anti-clockwise as in regular fashion. <clears throat> Then next, what we'll do is, as the question asks, the perpendicular from C is brought down to side AB, which essentially is asking for the line that would be where you would find the orthocenter of the triangle ACB. So we'll draw a perpendicular line down to AB. The question then says that the perpendiculars from point D, which we'll label this point on AB where C is brought down to, has perpendiculars to line CB, and line AC as F and E respectively. And now we can join line EF. The question is essentially asking us to prove that regardless of which vertice we had originally on the top, whether that be B or A, and which, which line we had brought down to the perpendicular of the opposite side, the length or the value of EF will always be the same. As Job Smith once said, with any geometry question, the wise thing would be to draw a circumcircle first. That's what we're going to do. We're going to draw a circumcircle, which is essentially a circle which the points A, B, and C all lie on. So now that we have the circumcircle drawn, it's really a question about how do we get EF in terms of something which won't be dependent on which direction the actual vertices are placed. And the only way to do this really would be to focus on the angles. Now on quick observation, so now that we've thought of this one rule, we can also look at another thing that could possibly be applied in this situation. When we're looking at a triangle in a circle, we could think of uh, Thales' property of an angle in a semicircle. But as we can see, this is an acute angle triangle. There are no degrees which are equal to 90. So we can therefore rule that property out for now. If we look at the circle ABC, nothing is really apparent from what we see so far. So it wouldn't be a wise step to continue from this point of view. But what we're trying to do is get EF in terms of the angles. So something that we could do is draw a circle that includes the points E and F. For example, the circle CD, E, F. And the reason for this is because just a few moments ago, we ruled out Thales' 90 degrees in a semicircle. But as we can see, CED and CFD are both right angled triangles, which would mean that the circle CEDF has a diameter of CD. Now, you may think that at this point, that's not very useful, but since we have our identity here of the extended sine rule, this can be very useful indeed. So we've got the length EF here, and since we know that CD is in fact the diameter of circle CEDF, we know that CEDF is a cyclic quadrilateral, as in C, D, E, and F all lie on the same circle. This means that we can form the triangle EFC as a triangle which has a diameter, sorry, a triangle in a circle with a diameter CD, which means that we can use our extended sine rule to try and find the value of EF, since sine C, EF over sine C, EF over sine C will equal to R, where R is the radius of the circle C, D, F, E. Obviously, our radius times two is just the diameter, so that would be the line C, D. So we can write that E, F over sine angle C equals line C, D. Now, since we're trying to convert this in a form where we're looking at just angles and the sine E, F, we can rewrite this as E, F equals C, D sine C, but obviously we still have a a length or a side in play, which means that we haven't properly found a solution. So now that we have CD and we know that CD is this line here on this circle of the diameter, 
but also we know that CD is the line that is perpendicular to AB and meets the vertex at C, we have right angle triangle ADC, which gives us the ability to use the regular sine rule or just regular trigonometry to find the value of CD. We'll call this angle here A, which means that sine of A equals CD, which is the opposite side over the hypotenuse CA, which yields that CD equals sine A, uh, sine A, CA. So with this substitution, we can now put this into our original thing and get EF equals sine A, sine C, C, A. But obviously we're not done because CA is still a line which can vary depending on which vertex is brought down. So we haven't reached a solution. Obviously we can see we're forming some kind of pattern here. We've got sine A, sine C. So the only sensible thing to think of next would be sine B. And for it to be sine B, we'd have to consider the whole triangle A, B, C. Since we have angle B as B, and we have the sense angle C, and we try and find AC in terms of sine. Now we look back at our original triangle ABC and our circle. And since we have one of the sides AC that we are trying to find in terms of angle B, we'll just use the extended sine rule again because we obviously have a circumcircle. And that will give us that A will take A as the sine AC. AC over the opposite angle sine B. equals, we'll take the 2R, which is R as the radius of this circumcircle here. Now we can write that as AC equals sine B 2R. And when we substitute that back in there, we get that EF equals sine A, sine B, sine C 2R where R is the radius of the circumcircle of ABC. Notice how angles A, B and C are independent of which vertices is chosen. And since the triangle itself never changes shape, the circumcircle will always have the same radius. This therefore is a definitive answer for a proof that EF is the same regardless which vertice is shown is taken to the top and essentially all that means is let's say A was at the top and we have our triangle like this or B was at the top and we have our triangle like this this line and this line and our points E and F here and here E and F will always be the same